intro music play fade in one one two three here we go so thanks for coming you're welcome thanks for having me it's been a minute uh, i think the last time we talked was uh at least three years ago like for a sit down interview like this yes you know we've kind of featured piper before this is piper of urban dirt company of north texas we used to say mckinney but that's shifted a little bit and we'll get into that yep we've moved and we have expanded into bigger and better opportunities and we keep growing i, I think it's interesting because a lot of the listeners have heard at least heard your story once or twice and if they haven't there's plenty of reasons to go back and listen to those but this has been i mean almost a six-year case study of what you've done day one up till this point and there's been a lot of changes and in particular in the last couple of years yep so i don't want to i don't want to go back too far in the past because that's again available but let's give let's give that five minute we met 2016 2013 yeah. i can't remember it's all a big mush right now it's a pretty interesting story and the relationship has has basically moved on to bigger and better things for both of us but i cold called you looking for information and trying to figure out how to grow in a controlled environment with the greenhouse. I was following every shiny object I could think of to try to get into the gardening as a business. And you were nice enough to give me some time. We met lots of people. We had lots of adventures. And literally six years later, my business has grown into something that supports at least a portion of our household and a couple other part-time people. And so it's been a a long six years of trial and error, but we found a few services that really create revenue for us. And it's been, I think it's been an exercise in uh, a lot of patience on your side. And I think you've balanced out, you've got it done. Like every step of the way you have made progress, you've built things, you've tried it out, you've beta tested a lot of stuff. Right. And I, th I think over the years, you've gotten faster and faster of, is this a good idea or not? Let's put in just the right amount of time of effort and money yes. to see if it's going to yield anything. You, you're you great at saying no to stuff. You're great at saying this is not going to work. Let's pivot. You know, especially the last couple of years, I think you've had to do a ton of pivots, but I think it's all worked out for the best. That's which, true. You know, I, I think a lot of ways the last couple of years have really forced people to, to get down and dirty to, to what they actually needed to do. So I, in some regards, I think it's one of the best things that's ever happened. Uh, so yeah the the last couple of years have fine-tuned where I spend my time and then where I deviate divvy out time and chores to other people so I have one part-time employee who's actually an employee um, I you know I have a CPA now I have an employee I've had to figure out how to run a business rather than be in the business you know they tell you learn how to um, run the business instead of doing all the 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 worker bee stuff. And I think the last couple of years has really allowed me to figure that out. For Urban Dirt Company, we were lucky and persistent and tenacious over the last few years to hang on to almost all of our commercial clients through, you know, the craziness that's gone on, which is interesting and surprising to me because almost all of our commercial clients are attached to or participate in a restaurant environment with chefs. And that seems to have been the industry that got just pummeled. And where we're at in North Texas, it came back fairly quickly. I know a lot of the chefs and restaurants don't feel that way. But we're, a, we're an amenity that they pay for. We're an extra service that they pay for to have a garden on their property. And we didn't lose anybody except one specific account that just either went out of business and, and couldn't do it. But we, we weathered it pretty well. And it gave us the launching pad that we're going to have coming into the spring to expand the business in another direction. So version point 1.0, just so we can cover it, is you were designing culinary gardens for chefs. I mean, still, still are. I'm not yes. saying where, but that's yes. kind of where it started out. A little bit of a pivot here and there, yes. working with some homeowners, which led to this new thing that we'll, we'll get into. But basically, your part in local agriculture for North Texas was serving the need of getting chefs their own culinary garden so they could have that experience, so they could have that uh, outdoor ambiance, whatever right. the case was, so yep. they could service their kitchen a little bit better and, and have all the benefits that came along with that. 
Yeah, the chefs primarily and the, the property manager and the chef, what they want is they want to add to their story. And so having a garden or an herb, a couple of herb beds or 18 garden beds, which is our largest garden, they have the opportunity to not only train their staff in what plants look like, the bar program gets to go out there, they understand edible flowers, and the gardens really help support what the story that they're trying to build. Our gardens can't produce enough food to you know fulfill the kitchen's needs, but for the herbs and for the flowers, they get a great deal of product out of that, and they can use that for a lot of their service. And it's really just a, a support for that, their business. And, and it's a great talking point. It's, it's great for Instagram. It's great for the reporters that come out. That's right. Everybody wants to come see the gardens and the chef gets to attach himself to a garden. They get to go out and take pictures while they're snipping off basil. They get to take pictures in the kitchen while they're, you know, plating things with parsley and, and beautiful edible flowers. It gives them a really unique twist on their advertising or their PR. And it also helps the chefs and their staff understand real flavors and the flavor palettes that come with, uh, again, herbs and flowers primarily. But we grow stuff that most homeowners don't grow. You know, Tokyo turnips aren't something you're going to go out and grow, but they're cute little white golf ball sized turnips that the chefs just think are great. And they get to utilize that unique experience for their kitchen. I think it's also good to bridge that, like if a chef is having to I mean, even minimally take care of this garden or be a part of it. I think they understand what the farmers that they're buying from, in addition yeah. to that, are going through and have a little bit more appreciation for it. I've I've seen it work to where it's like, okay, every leaf does count. There, yes. It does take an enormous amount to get something to the restaurant. To forget the plate. It. Forget farm to table. Forget farm to plate. But how does it actually get to the, to the chef? True. Now he's having to peel off, you know, dead stuff and the thin things and, and things the like that. The dirt and brown leaves. That's correct. Yes, and the to get the chefs to come out is a little bit of a challenge because, you know, they've got a schedule. They work a lot late evenings and nights. We're primarily taking care of the gardens during the day. What happens is we have to go in physically and engage them, or we harvest a little bit and we take it in and we have a conversation about here's what's available, here's what you can use. We We also know the culinary world a little bit, so we know what not to take them that they can't use. We're not going to cut a bunch of, um, a whole bunch of stuff that we know they can't use because then it goes to waste. But to educate the kitchen staff is interesting because they do understand the hardships of actually growing plants. And we're in a, a Texas winter right now where we don't normally have severe winters. And we've had two severe winters in a row where the gardens are struggling and there's nothing going on. So they understand now that they can't they can't, they can't go out and do anything. So now they've got to go back to their vendors and figure out how to shift their menus. But it's an education for them as well to understand the process of, you know, seed to plate, plant to plate, whatever you want to call it. They have a very good understanding now of what it takes to get a crop out of the dirt, clean it, harvest it, take it to the kitchen, figure out how to use it. Um, it's, it's a really good learning curve for the culinary industry. Make no mistake about the business that we do. We love growing food crops. Um, my particular piece of this industry, we're in this for the business. We call it gas, gardening as a service. It's kind of our tagline in all the PowerPoints that we do when we talk about um, gardening as a service. We are providing a service to an industry, which happens to be the culinary industry or some property managers use it as a, a green amenity for their, you know, to um, to show that their campus is, you know, a progressive or ahead of the curve. They've got interesting things. It's very similar to having a great coffee shop or a yoga studio or a gym. It's an amenity and it's a green amenity. And because of that, we've been able to expand to green walls. Uh, in addition to gardens, we may get into cut flower gardens on large properties but we're providing a service, and that service is to benefit the client. And if the garden is not benefiting either the chef or the property managers, then they're not, they're not going to pay the bill. So we have to do everything we can to keep those gardens looking good. We have to keep them pest-free. 
we end up pulling a lot of plants when most people would harvest because we are also technically a landscape business. Right. And as a landscape business, we have a specific schedule and mar- money margins and revenue streams that we need to consider where we don't always operate as a farmer. We're operating it as a landscaper. And that's a little bit different for me than it is for growers or farmers because sometimes I sacrifice those crops in order to get what I need to get out of it, which is a landscape element for the client. And the client, you I always think that you have two clients. You have the chefs who want whatever they want, whatever. Right. Whatever they want the beautiful into. food. And then the people that cut the checks by and large are either a property manager or the owner of the land or the owner, owner of the building, Restaurant building or, the yep. hot- or the hotel itself. So that's true. Uh, you just you just talked about being a landscape company, me being a past landscaper. There, it's everything has to be perfect all the time. Right now, you have a chef garden. What are you doing in the Texas winter months? Where, I mean, by and large, it's just there's nothing there, it's or there not there perfect. could be. So, what? How are you navigating that? Yeah, as a landscaper, you do follow certain rules where things need to be beautiful all the time. As an edible garden landscaper. We proactively tell our clients, whether it is the chef or it is the property manager or the hotel staff, these are food crops and they're not going to be beautiful all the time. And some of the food crops we're going to let go to a certain point because we want them for a different reason. We want the the arugula to bolt, the cilantro to bolt, because we actually want the flowers. They can buy cilantro, you know, off off the truck. What they can't get is fresh cilantro flowers. And so we have a little bit different place in the scheme there. But to keep an edible garden perfect all the time is a misnomer. It's impossible. It's not going to happen. Um, food crops get swapped out a lot quicker than um, ornamentals or landscape plants. And we have a schedule. In the off season, for instance, we got caught up last year in, in the storm where we, we weren't prepared, but... Going forward in the cold season, we will start doing cover crops and we will follow a, a farming process, a farming mechanism or a growing, growing mechanism and cover crops because we have two or three months where we aren't producing anything. Right now in January and February, it's pretty barren and we're, we're struggling to figure out, you know, how can we look at something besides dirt? And, you know, the hotel is calling us saying, hey, these beds, they're empty. Well, we can't put anything in there right now because it, it won't make it, and we'll just have to replant it. So we're gonna we're gonna start focusing a little bit more on cover crops, and for no other reason than just to have a visual interest, something in the ground, whether it's clover or bar, we don't know because we can't just have brown dirt, and that's a landscape process rather than a gardening process. And for I can just here right now people are going why don't you plant kale why don't why don't you plant cabbage yes um pest management is my number one concern with that because we can't we service these gardens once a week and the larger gardens we service twice a week we literally are on site twice a week we can't be there at five o'clock at night when the sun goes down and cover things up and move things over that's the nature of the landscape side of the business if we were just pure gardeners, we would have to figure out how to do that. So the kale and the cabbage, the beautiful ordinary stuff that you know most city de- departments put out on the corners of their downtown square, it's just not interesting and, and it's ordinary. It's just another one. It's just another, another, one another one. And that's what separates us from the landscapers as an edible garden company is we want to also educate that there's other stuff that can grow this time of year. And the cover crops, one of those things we've talked about for a while, it's an interesting conversation. You know, if we let that flower, we've got flowers that so could be edible. And I would say even if you had kale or cabbage, the amount that you would harvest off that is so insignificant for that, the footprints that you're so talking about. So minimal. Doesn't right. matter. And for me, it's another set of plants that need to be acquired or grown. And so it's another set in the, the three or four seasons that we've already planned out. Now I've got to have those plants in the nursery or I've got to find a place to purchase them in time. And I just haven't worked those extra non-useful plants into the plan. You don't just do one type of garden. I mean, you've got a rooftop, you've got a campus, you've got a large one. Let's let's talk about just some of the different ones you have so people can get an idea of the, 
of the scope and the range that you're having to deal with as a an urban farmer, a an urban gardener, a landscape company, and plus dealing with these chefs and and all that right. stuff. There's all kind. You're not just doing one thing. It, these are custom setups for whatever the situation is. So let's go through a couple of those. Okay. Um, this is my small business owner hat, right? This is, I'm running a small business and the small business has to figure out what the client needs. And each client has a little bit different. I have, I have two ways of thinking about this. The strategy is to try to create something unique for that particular client and their space while also not recreating the wheel. And we talk about that a lot in farming where, you know, there's certain processes that work. There's certain products that, um, that just work. And every time you, you change those processes, there's this whole effect. Well, I can't do that in every location. So I need to also consider the plants that I'm buying or growing. I don't want to grow. I grow spigarelli for one particular chef. It's a, can you do this while you say that? Yeah. I I grow spigarelli, (laughs) which is a leafy (laughs) broccoli from, you know, the Italian seed company which in and of itself was difficult to get, difficult to grow. It's a brassica. It's got, you know, pest management issues, but it's unique and interesting. And I, I wanted to fit that plant in as many gardens as I could. So I was trying to create this unique experience for one client while using the same plant because I'm going to start a bunch of trays of it. I might as well grow enough for two or three gardens. And it turns out there's another chef that knows what it is and is interested in having it. And the first chef wasn't you know, offended or upset that I was sharing that particular plant with Imagine another they garden. Knew each other. Yeah, and they all know each other. It's it's Dallas. They all know each other. So the different types of gardens that we service are they're all raised beds. We don't plant in the ground. At at this time we don't do any directly in the ground planting. And that's because we are not farmers. We're landscapers. And we, so all the raised beds are several different types of material. The majority of our beds are some sort of concrete panel. We have a specific product that we like to use called Durable Green Bed. And they're large, uh, recycled concrete panels. And they, they're heavy and they last for, I don't know, five decades. And so we put those together. Plus they're industrial and, and the property managers like them. So everything's a raised bed. Uh, The Thompson Hotel in downtown Dallas, for instance, is a rooftop garden. It's more of a, it's the ninth floor patio. And it's a 53-story building. We're on the ninth floor where it juts out to the south just enough to get just enough sun between the skyscrapers to accommodate leafy greens and some herbs. We struggled with peppers. So it it's very specific to their needs. It's pretty small. There's, um, you know, maybe 300 plants. It's, that seems like a lot, but it's food crops. So they're stuffed together and we deal with wind, we deal with shade, but the bar program is utilizing this garden like crazy. The kitchen, not so much. The chef didn't really get what he wanted, but he's okay with that because now his bar program is killing it with flowers and rosemaries and they're doing all kinds of interesting stuff I think so we need to do a little bit more research i that, mean you and i <laughs> so. it's it then that that's a rabbit trail i could go down probably with a lot of restaurants i could probably pursue a lot more accounts if i focused on bar program plants which would be you know herbs for mixed drinks and it would be edible flowers and things that have very interesting flavor palettes that they can use for their their bar programs. The the bar managers would be a good target for me and for anybody actually growing. And then the different, so the different types of gardens we have, mostly they're raised beds that we've got the rooftop garden. We've got 18 beds at the village Meridian. Uh, we have an alley garden. It's literally in the alley behind a building between another hotel that gets predominant shade, it rarely gets any sun. So we put up grow lights that come on during the day because at night the lights would disturb the residents in the hotel. So we had to work with the restaurant on putting in irrigation and timers and it just gets no sun. So we, you know, we had to figure out what will grow in six hours of artificial light, even though it's outside. 
And then everything else is, is pretty standard raised beds out on the campus, um, sort of like you would see a playground out in the middle of a campus. It's, there's a garden out there. Legacy Central and Plano is probably one of the best ones. It gets great sun. It's protected from the north wind by a building. The kitchen is literally, you know, 20 feet from the garden. They walk out during service and, and cut extra parsley. It's it's fantastic. I think that's my favorite one you do because of the exposure that the people eating in the restaurant have to. They yeah. have to walk by it to get to the front They door. have to walk by it. And they have a picnic table. The client chose to put a picnic table and, and umbrella out there so people could sit. We painted the, the panels to match the, the scheme of the campus, the color scheme of the campus. And it's probably the best garden we've done to date. And I think it's almost three and a half years old. So it's it's going strong. I also like that because the chef is super involved. Yes, VJ I mean. is out there all the time. Yeah, and the chefs, you know, the chefs are interesting characters. Um, they have a reputation of what kind of people they are. But if you are a vendor to a chef and you don't pay attention to when his restaurant opens, when it closes, when he's the busiest, when you can actually talk to him, when you shouldn't go talk to him. And this is true not only for me as a landscaper, grower but as anybody who wants to service a restaurant you need to understand what their job is and if you can't it's not just cooking and it's not just cooking and all the chefs that i deal with are not the cooks they are you know their title represents that they're over several people or an entire department or an entire campus an executive chef isn't always in the kitchen and has other stuff to do. And has multiple locations in a lot of and times. And has multiple locations. So if you're going to grow, if you're going to participate in that environment as a vendor, it's important for you to manage your information skillfully so that you don't overwhelm them. You know, give them what they need to know. Nothing more, nothing less. And, and stick to your time frame. If they tell you to come between... and two and four and don't come a minute after four o'clock because you know the kitchen's busy don't come a minute after four o'clock you know just do it the right way and you'll be successful the chefs are very interested in unusual unusual and unique and they know each other and they want it first right they want that cute little marigold gem flower that you just started growing they want it first and so you have to figure out how to give it to them all first without them knowing. <laughs> maybe you don't post it on social media right away. Maybe you, you know, make your rounds and then you, you post your pictures. But um, that relationship with the chef and not just the chef, but the, you know, the, the few positions down from them, each restaurant has a different, they all have their own hierarchy of people. You need to keep that in mind. You need to know who is second, who is third, who is the bar manager. Who's the one who's cutting the check, if, if you can get to that person? And who's more likely to come out and visit with you in the garden? Because it's not always the chef. Right. It's usually someone that they're training or someone that they trust. And that person, chef de cuisine, sous chef, whoever the next one down, that relationship is just as important. And you can't ignore them. Have their cell phone. We text a lot of our chefs, and actually now we don't text the chefs as much. We text the the group of people that are using the gardens, and that keeps the chef free and clear from any of the weeds of the business. Only in dire emergencies or really important decisions, maybe changing seasons, would we go directly to, you know, the main chef. So I think another aspect of the business is you are still starting seed starts. You still have an operational farm at your location. The last time we talked, you were living in McKinney, Texas. You've since moved out to the county. Right. I don't, I don't know how. You've, you've got a few acres Six. now. You have outdoor beds. You still have your raised beds. Now you have uh, our all-metal hoop house. That was the first all-metal hoop house. 12 by 60, uh, yes. All the pictures were from your place when we... And so, We've manipulated it, but it's still, it's still usable. And so you're having to juggle seed starting ultra specialty stuff for chefs and still sourcing things from regional growers around here to right. to kind of do that. I mean, how, how many seeds are you starting at any one given time? Because I know it's just like, seems to me it's a constant rotation. It is constant rotation. And as a farmer, you have a schedule, you have seasons and you can, 
if you if you're smart, you figure out your you know your succession planting and your scheduling. You know, one or two seasons in, you start building your spreadsheets. Um, as a market gardener, it may take you a little bit longer, a few more seasons, because now you're trying to accommodate uh, a customer that's coming to buy from you. So your market garden may shift each season based on your customer. As a gas, <laughs> gardening as a service, edible landscape co company, we have standard crops, you know, standard lettuces, um, mustard greens, kale, stuff like that. But we also have specialty crops that we need to figure out if we can grow enough of these in a small space, a couple of beds, four by eight or four by 16 beds. Can we grow enough of this to make it useful for the chef? And it has to meet two criteria. It has to be a little bit of production. And even if it's a short run, even if it's a couple of meals, even if it's one or two weeks that the chef is doing a special, Sun Gold Tomatoes, right? Um, that's a big one right now. Spigarelli, leafy green. It's unusual flavor, leafy green that they use for show and for specific uh, salads. So my criteria is not only can I get, get, either grow or buy enough of it in the time frame that I need to put into three or four or five or six beds, and can I get it again and probably again? Because if a chef goes out there and harvests one of my four by eight beds and I've only got four of those, that gives me four to six weeks of a product. Now I've got to figure out what else I'm going to put in that bed. And that fourth week is liable to be vastly different in taste and it's texture. It's way all different. That. I mean, because we're in an urban environment. So now the sun is coming over the top of the building three weeks later. Now it's in full sun. Whereas the first couple of weeks that crop was primarily in the shade because you know, where it's situated in the urban area or, you know, you know, the Texas summer kicks in and everything starts bolting. We're constantly trying to figure out, and I do have a planting schedule. It goes out the window once in a while when we have extreme weather, but my struggle as a business owner is figuring out what unique crops I can put in a culinary application, culinary garden application, rather than just, you know, growing whatever is available and then, which means what can the chef actually use? And then the second is availability. And so the availability pushes me into two directions, whether I can buy from a local organic vendor or have somebody that I know grow it. I have several master gardeners in the area that love to grow patio versions of tomatoes. Um, sometimes those are useful, sometimes they're not. I have two or three people who really just want to focus on the spigarelli or the flowering broccoli is where it's cut and come again. Can I count on them to give it to me consistently for like six weeks? Or am I going to have to go out into my little seed room and spend some time doing this? We have a lot of seeds. So we have a, we have a seed room. It's, it's just an addition to our garage. We have shelves and ebb and flow and grow lights set up in there. It's the same room as most country people have an extra room, an extra refrigerator. We've turned it into a seed room. We also have a large market garden in our backyard that we've built, and that's primarily for us as a family. It's also for me to put plants in the ground to see what they're going to look like in the chef's garden. So I grow in my garden what I'm growing for the chefs because I want to know what's happening to those plants. And then the third thing is we have the bootstrap. Um, all metal frame. Ours is a 12 by 60. We've divided in half. Half of it is full plastic and half of it is full shade. So in Texas, we move from right now we've got stuff, seed starts in the plastic half. And then as we get warm, we open the door and we have a sh basically a shade hoop house in the back half. And so we've, we've modified that to meet our needs in, in Texas. The wind is phenomenal here and we've not had any problems keeping the hoop house up in the wind we've just struggled with heat as everybody who grows in the south is going to struggle with heat if you don't figure out what kind of shade cloth you need ahead of time you know you're just you're missing the game you've got to figure that out we're we're 40 50 percent on most of our stuff we have a little bit of 30 percent on our our raised beds for lettuce uh, but that's that's a trial and error thing these urban gardens, they're in a public space. 
is there any concern about vandalism or cigarette butts or oh, yeah. what people are doing afterwards and how are you guys getting around? I mean, it's, it is what it is, right? <laughs> sure. People are wondering. Well, you know, if you ever go out to a restaurant and you go sit on the patio and you're having a cocktail and a smoke, I mean, what do you do with your cigarette butt, right? Do you get up and walk to the, the cigarette light? I mean, most people just don't think. Um, we put signs in all of our gardens. We have um, branded signs that on posts that we stick in the ground that say, hey, this is the chef's garden. We, we call out the restaurant so that people know that this garden is attached to that restaurant. And we have QR codes so that if people really are interested, they can you know scan the QR code and find out more about our business and sometimes more about the garden. But the cigarette butt thing and the cocktail napkin and the plastic cups and, you know, and the the, straws. the little sword with the, the cherry on it, that those show up constantly. We're just, it's just part of the landscape business gig. You go in, you check the plants, you clean out the trash, you check the drip system, you know, you move on to the next bed. I'm glad you said drip system because I, I know that was a hurdle uh, for you at, at one point. Yeah. We had a lot of talks about landscape irrigation, which is a little, well, I'm not even going to say it. It's, it's pretty different than what most farmers, there's no drip. There's right. a different type of drip line. There's, it's just a completely different setup. Well, it's a commercial what, system. It's way higher pressure. And oftentimes it's tied into the regular ornamental stuff. Yep. So you and I have had to have, you know, talks about controllers. Controlling and the it. big thing is the access. Who has access to this? Can you get access to it? Where's the water line? Right. How, you know, where's the solenoids? Irrigation is probably my Achilles heel. As a as a gardener for myself, it's easy. I go home, I, I do it, it blows out, I replace it, no big deal. In the commercial setting, I'm almost 100%, maybe with one exception, I'm 100% tied to the landscape system that's already installed on the campus, either at the hotel, at the restaurant, because it's part of a, you know, a campus in and of itself. There's a separate landscape company that takes care of those. Sometimes there's a separate property manager, landscape person, and there's two or three people who have keys to the timer. The <laughs> The conversations that we have, because we water the food gardens a lot more often and a lot differently than they water their landscape plants. If I'm lucky, we get invited into the project really early on at the village, the Meridian restaurant in Dallas. We were invited into this process really, really early, so early that they were still building out everything. We, I mean, so early that we were wearing hard hats and badges for the first six months because we were part of the construction process. And the opportunity to talk to the landscape installation company that early on was huge because I got my own zones. I got as many zones as I wanted. There's 23 beds on that campus, 18 of them for the chef. The others um, are left over for the, for the residents. So we don't manage those, but they're all tied into a very extensive irrigation system. But I was able to get my own zones, my own timing, and I have a contact which I can text weekly if I need to saying, hey, it's going to be really hot this week. I need you to bump up from uh, two waterings a day to four waterings a day. And here's how many minutes I need them to run each day. And we utilize farming equipment. We utilize um, half inch poly. We put in um, manifests in each bed if we can. We do a lot of uh, pressure regulators and then we use drip tape, which, you know, is it's evil sometimes because it's just so f fragile. Everything does cut the drip tape like if you're digging out a plant and you hit it with your your snips that whole piece is done you replace it um but drip tape has come to be my friend because i can replace it quickly i can run as many rows as i want i can put it exactly where i need it the, the struggle for me irrigation wise this is i teach this class i mean this is a whole separate class irrigation 101 is like a phd level class you don't talk about anything else but irrigation for an hour because there's so many things you can do um, we we try to figure out, we plant a lot of stuff by seed, so arugula and mustards and carrots and radishes and turnips and beets, we, we plant by seed. So we're either broadcasting or we're planting rows. Well, seeds need to be wet a lot, so I kind of need a sprinkler for like a few days or a week. But then I need it to go to drip system because then, then I need to water the roots. 
So we figured out that we can put micro sprayers down the middle of the beds on a poly tube with an on off switch. And so we, we do the sprayers for the first couple of days until we get germination. And then we can go in and manually turn that particular row off and then the drip tapes get turned on. So now I'm watering by roots. That does two things. It, it, it's enormously useful in germinating seeds directly in the beds, which keeps me having, buy, having to buy mature plants, some of them which I, you, know, you can't buy turnips, whatever. But it also gives me control over how much water goes down, when it goes down, uh, it keeps me involved in the garden, but it's expensive. It's a lot of irrigation parts and pieces in a single and four it, by eight bed. It's also kind of like buying tires. Nobody wants to buy tires. They're no. expensive, but they're so necessary. You have to it's have It's not it. a fun expense for people to do. No, but it's so useful because I, I budget now, you know, $60, $70 per bed because in just the irrigation, I have 23 beds at the village. Each of those beds has probably 35 to $40 worth of irrigation in each bed which means for you as a business owner that's going to service this is you have to have those parts on hand i need on the truck to have at them all times ready to go right so i have buckets you know in my my warehouse we've got extra parts i go out of my way to order stuff that i think isn't going to be available seasonally you can tell that there's certain things that are just going to get bought up the drip tape has one type of uh, fitting the half inch poly has a different type of fitting you need to have you know, storage and access to both of those. You need to figure out how to connect them together. There's, you know, there's some brain matter going on here to piece this together. I think this is real important because we're dealing with, with this right now. It's some drip tape is pressure compensated where they all yes. come out evenly. Some is not. Some have one gallon a minute, half gallon. A minute. It, there's not all drip tape is the same. No, it's not. And I would say that in the beginning I was cheap because I didn't think I needed it and I spent more time going back to these gardens fixing blowouts or I would come back a few before I had my first employee before Megan worked with me I would go back you know three days later and there'd be a, a big puddle of water on the ground well I knew something was broken and the problem is I'm not always there when the water's running because it's on the timer that the landscaper has picked so I'm sometimes not there when I need to be there when the water's actually running. And so you come back and you see this big puddle and then you go looking for the ripped piece. And so I was cheap in the beginning and I, now I buy, everything's pressure compensated for me. Um, I buy in rolls of 100 or 200. I buy rolls. Like I don't get 50 feet because that doesn't last but two beds. Right. And I hang on to it and I carry it in the back of our vehicles, extra parts. I mean, so <laughs> it's so fun here. You talk about irrigation now <laughs> as, as the expert. It's you know, not fun. I <laughs> know uh, it's not fun. And then I want to talk about all the different skill sets, just that aspect of your company has. You have to learn how to read blueprints. You have yes. to learn how to deal with installers. You're having to deal with solenoids, which require electricity, which require right. the timer. If a zone isn't coming on, it could be one of it could four be tons or five things. of different things, and you got to find the person who's got the key access. Are they in this half of the campus? Um, you know, at, at, so at the hotel, the Thompson Hotel, this is a historic building that was remodeled from the ground up. It has very old water systems. the The fire department had a really hard time certifying it because they had so many old outlets, and on the ninth floor, where the gardens are, there was one hose bib one hose bib that we were all sharing and it's not just me there's a swimming pool on the ninth floor that they were filling by hose there's you know a handful of trees that they were trying to grow there were 63 agave plants that they planted and it, this is just on one floor and one hose bib so knowing the right person Honestly, this was a relationship building exercise. Uh, this is what we need for this garden to survive. I need you to run irrigation to these beds. I cannot manage these beds off of a hose that I may not have access to when I'm here because they're filling the pool. Right. So the skill set number one, pre number one priority is as a grower or as a business owner is relationship management. You have to talk to people. You can't be a farmer, a grower, a business owner and not be a people person. I mean, you don't have to be their best friend, but you just you have to do it. There's just no way around it. Go find the maintenance guy. You know, buy him a Coke. 
whatever, pat him on the back, tell him your name, tell him when you're there, ask about his family. That person has keys to everything. They have keys to the irrigation box. They have keys to the extra hoses on the, you know, whatever. Um, <laughs> so know who you need to go to. The second thing is you really do need to understand the parts and pieces of your business. For me, the parts and pieces of my business are landscape oriented. I didn't know anything about manifest solenoids. I barely knew the difference between drip tape and, and half inch poly. I thought the fittings were the same. I went months with things blowing off because the pressure was too high. I didn't even know what a pressure regulator was. Now I know that there's various sizes. I know how to test the pressure on any given system. You know that if you don't have a backflow preventer, I know somebody's going to come and that's going to be a checklist on some things. Somebody's going to right come and tell me to tear it apart and start over, which cost me time and money. And, and that's expensive. For us, we're traveling to these gardens. So now it's another hour drive down to Dallas to take care of, you know, a, a drip system that basically came apart. This can take me five minutes to fix, but I had to drive an hour to get there. So if you don't figure out the parts and pieces, you're going to spend a lot of time repairing things. And that that's way more expensive in the long run. The second piece is, you know, soil management in a, in a raised bed for us is different on the ninth floor than it is in a raised bed that's on the ground we had to buy rooftop soil mix and we almost had to rent a crane to have it brought up because we didn't have access to the freight elevator during the time of construction and i thought good lord how am i gonna rent a crane to move 100 bags of, of soil I, who knew i was gonna have to do that we didn't we ended up getting a, a time slot on the freight, the one freight elevator that this building had working, and it was at eight o'clock at night. So Megan and and Darren and myself went down there at eight o'clock at night, and bought up three pallets worth of soil up and down the freight elevator, in about three hours, in the dead of night, for this garden. It was crazy. So we had to learn how to you know manage that, delivery drivers, uh, soils, and then. You know, plants is a whole nother thing. Unloading downtown Dallas and dealing with the traffic and yeah. Oh, yes. Parking a delivery truck in downtown Dallas. It was better at eight o'clock at night, of course, because, you know, there's there's nobody down there. But there's other people down there what? at eight o'clock at night that what? are interested in what you're doing. And one person would stay with the truck and the other two people would run bags up the freight elevator and unload, come back down. Of course, it was under construction. So we were required to wear hard hats and masks and, you know be badged the benefit of being brought in early in construction is that we get to be part of the the planning process which helps me long term but the other side of that is we had to come to all the safety meetings for the construction crew we had to go through their safety program and get certified get pictured and badged so that we could get on site the village and the thompson were both construction sites when we built the garden so we constantly were you know, worried about OSHA and, you know, where's your hard hat? Where's your orange vest? And are you supposed to be, or you have to show your badge to the, to the gate to get in that I didn't think I was going to be in the construction business. I thought I was in the gardening business, but you know, I was in the construction business. I got kicked off uh, one day because I was wearing, um, soft shoes, slip-ons, you know, um, Merrill slip-ons. And I, I wasn't wearing boots. And they they kicked me out. They said, you got to go put some boots on. Well, I didn't have any boots with me. So I just had to leave that day. And then I had to get um, safety vests for everybody. I had to get hard hats for everybody. Everybody had to wear glasses. This was during the pandemic. And we all had to wear masks. And constantly getting yelled at for, you know, put your mask back on. We're building gardens. We're trying to, you know, do this. And we're, we're worried about other stuff. All right. Check, check boxes. I think it's so fast. I mean, this obviously this is a farming podcast and we're talking about all this stuff. And the reason we're sitting here talking about it is because this is this is another way to service this industry and this need that everybody has. And a lot of people are, well, you just go do it. Well, you don't this conversation do from tip to bottom has shown that there's so many other things to consider in every one of those considerations is an expense and something that you need to account for time effort and yeah I, i'm in i'm in the agricultural sector building culinary gardens for chefs 
But what I'm really in is small business owner. So the next thing I want to talk about is I believe the biggest hurdle that you had to overcome. And I think it's the biggest hurdle that most people have is that when to hire that first person. Now that you finally did, how much better is life? And uh, if you had any advice for moving forward with that. Yes. Everybody thinks they can do it all for a long period of time. And you, you get to a tipping point where you don't have the opportunity to take on another project or to do anything for yourself because you spend every single day putting on your boots and your gloves and going and doing it yourself. And never mind the physical wear and tear, but the actual process of growing a business or whether it's a farm or a landscape business or a microgreens business, the pinch points are always going to be labor and how many hours in the day can you put towards that. And until you get in your head that you actually are making enough money to pay somebody else to do it, you never think you're there. You always think, I'm not there yet. I can't afford it yet. But the week that you do it, the first week that that payroll comes out or the, that you transfer funds from PayPal, it's the scariest thing ever because that money is going to somebody else instead of to you. But each week that you do that, each month that you generate payroll, you understand that you've just moved your tasks from working in the business to working on the business. And that's a huge thing for owners to get to. Um as soon as I got help, as soon as Megan was available to me, even though she really only did really one garden one day a week, it was four hours out of a week that I didn't have to drive to Dallas, that I didn't have to do. And that quickly became, she did every garden once a week. And just recently it's gone to, you know, she she's making the multiple trips now. I rarely go to Dallas to do the actual gardening if I'm going to see these clients, it's for other reasons. It's for major irrigation issues, which are always going to be there, or to see the chef or to figure out, you know, what do we what do we need to do? It's never the actual task or, dare I say, busy work of actually gardening. How did you finally, <laughs> and, and I know that you never really can as a business owner, but you have to delegate and you have to let go and know no matter how good these people are, they could be the best. Right. They're still not going to do it exactly the way. I don't, right. I don't care what you write down, what you show, what example that you have. They're never going to do it exactly the way you would as the business owner. Right. But at some point you do have to let go and realize their very best, even though it may not be your best, is still much better than what the client hopefully is expecting. Right. And part of that is taken care of by picking the right person, which is, you know, hard to do in and of itself. But if you've developed relationships along the years, you you know people in your industry, you have other businesses that you're doing business with, you have to keep your eyes open the whole time looking for people. I have two or three people in my head right now that I've run, run into over the last year that I think, oh, my gosh, when I'm ready, that I'm, I'm calling I'm calling them. I'm calling him. I'm calling her. In my mind, I already have two or three people that I think would fit. Now, when when the business develops to a point when there's room for those people, they're already on my roster right. in my mind. So that was number one. I've known Megan for a really long time, and she worked for an, another farmer. And I know her as a friend. I know her family. I know her kids. I know her husband. It was a no-brainer when she became available. It was a no-brainer to ask Megan to be part of my team. Uh, I trusted her. I knew that her her knowledge with plants and with growing was what I needed. Um, she's she will tell you that she doesn't want to be. She doesn't want to manage people. She doesn't want to go sell. She's not that person, and I'm okay with that. I can still do those things. I have another person in mind that that can do that. Um, so I, I picked Megan based on an idea that I had for a long time. Once the time came, actually, like I said, cutting her a check, sending her the money, you know, that was the hardest part. Giving up that revenue, it benefited her ginormously. Um, she's very happy what she's doing. We have a good relationship. I don't know what's going to happen when I have 10 employees. I don't know if I'm going to feel the same about every single employee that I feel about 
Megan, um, were the next two people that helped me part time. But you, it helped me so much that I don't worry about whether she's doing it exactly the way I want. I do have processes in place, my own internal uh, personal business spreadsheet, my processes I'm developing, employee handbook, if you want to put it a different way. I, I do have written ideas so that at some point where I get to a point where I can't manage individual people, I do have something to give to them as they come on board. And I don't believe that Megan and I need that right now, but there may become a time where there's so many tasks going on that we need to have a written plan right now. We spent a lot of time texting each other about, hey, this is what's going on in this garden. This is what's going on in that garden. Um, legacy needs more parsley. Okay, it's on my list to purchase or to grow. That process is still pretty manual. We will get to a point where we need to have a, a program for that. And at this scale, I think being manual is completely fine. It, it's part of the charm of having, having a small business. Yeah. But to your credit, and one of the things I've thought has always been very important to any business, especially farms, is to is to look at big companies and look at how that hierarchy is structured. There's a finance manager. Right. There's a media manager. There's the guy that running the whole thing. There's a buyer. There's right. There's you know, so many middle layers. management. There's all these things that play a very specific role. While as a small business, as a small farmer, it's okay to have one person doing multiple roles. Sure. Which one do you not like the most? Which one are you terrible at? Those are your first hires. Yeah. And the one that was the hardest for me, because we moved from McKinney to uh, uh, further out, we live in a, a small town further, about 25 minutes from McKinney. I'm an hour and 15 minutes from downtown Dallas. Even though the benefit to me moving onto property, having the ability to grow my own plants, do my own stuff, it took me out of my comfort zone of being able to service those accounts that were paying the bills. So what I hated was the drive into the city because of the time it took me to do it. Not because I didn't want to go garden, because I I hated giving up that amount of time because it was time I could use doing other stuff. So having Megan come on board because she lives much closer to the accounts than I do was a huge weight off my shoulder because again, like I didn't hate the gardening part. I just hated the the commute and, and I had to figure out a way to, to get that time back. So that was a huge thing just to give her those accounts. What will happen next is what I really want to happen is the two or three people that work for me part-time to do the installs what I'd really like to work on next is training them in the installation process from soup to nuts so that I don't have to be on site when we install the next garden. What I really, really want is to find somebody that can do the irrigation so that when the drip tape blows up, it's not me that's driving to Dallas to do a, a five minute repair um, and to have the ability to, to stockpile equipment with each of these people, you know, to have a stuff on, on their truck, so to speak. Right. I would love to get out of the irrigation business personally. <laughs> and you know, you never will. So you, I know I never will, but that's okay. So that ability to have labor allowed you the time to do the very next big step in your company, which is the thing we're going to talk about in the next podcast. Right. So, um, it's been fun catching up and it's been fun sitting here listening to you talk about Reminisce things that, about you, that you worried about so much, you know, that, that we all worry about so much. And then now that you're speaking on it at an expert level, it's just been fun to see. So I know it's been a little uh, monotonous for some people, you know, that are here just for whatever farming reasons there are, but taking care of this niche like you are, I think it's a good example of everything that you talk about can be directly applied to things you need to worry about on the farm. Yep. Because you talk a lot about about the um, the landscaping issue of it. That's part of about keeping a clean, efficient farm as it's well. It's efficiency. It's being organized, figuring out your succession planning, thinking ahead to the next season, what you're going to need, and, and planning ahead for irrigation, planning ahead for plants, planning ahead for soil, amendments. Uh, supply chain is tough right now. So if you're not thinking to the next season, you're going to pay more for what you could get now. So if you're not good at spreadsheets, just start taking notes. Um, and that applies to farmers in particular because it's only going to get harder for us to grow food crops. 
Well, in the next episode, we're going to talk about the uh, Urban Dirt Company Design Studio and what how, how you got to there and what's next up on your plate. So very much looking forward to that. Again, thanks for being here. We'll thanks, Nick. I appreciate the opportunity. And the, the champagne actually just kicked in. Yeah, yeah. <laughs>